Hello and welcome back. We're now going to talk about how to get signals between different clock domains. So far I've been encouraging you in your designs to stick to one clock frequency and use one edge only. You'll actually now see the reasons for that because crossing between different clock domains is actually quite tedious and inserts quite a bit of extra delay. Nonetheless, in many chips, there are multiple clock domains. The reasons can be quite simple. Uh, some unit might operate a lot better at a faster clock than a, than a slower clock to get more throughput. But nonetheless, that still means we have to communicate between the two, two different clock domains, at least at some level of the design, frankly, often at a quite high level of the design. There are basically two techniques to do this. When going from a slower domain to a faster domain, you can use a resynchronizer. In other situations, when the two clocks are roughly the same, or you're going from a faster domain to a slower domain, you need a more complex solution of an asynchronous first in, first out buffer. These techniques are taken from these two papers by Cummings. Both of these are quite easily discoverable on the web. Uh, and uh, also in the uh, Moodle pages. So this is a rough illustration of the problem. Let's say our chip consists of, has two clocks distributed on it, and we have to cross between, some signals have to cross between these two clocks. You might recall that there's a lot of random variation in the delay from the clock source to the clock leaves. You've got different process conditions leading to fast and slow buffers. You've got different temperatures leading to, again, fast or slow buffers. Thus, even if these two clocks were the same, you'd really have no idea of the phase relationship, that is the relative arrival time of clock edges, at these two nodes in opposing in different clock domains that you're trying to communicate between. You simply don't know it at all. Even if the clocks are related by some common factor, again, that large variation in delay from clock tree to clock tree means you won't know what the actual phase is for any particular set of process conditions or any particular set of temperatures. Furthermore, sometimes the clocks might be unrelated. Here I pick two prime numbers, and their relationship will furthermore vary cycle to cycle, uh, uh, which uh, will, will be even worse because so one clock will continuously overtake the other clock. So you might think one solution would be just have a pair of flip-flops. One flop in clock one, one flop in clock two, and communicate between the two domains. That way, resynchronizing across its edge. The problem with this is that for some set of conditions or at some point in time, the signal A coming from clock domain one will be changing during the setup and hold period around the edges in clock domain 2. This will mean this flip-flop will go metastable, have somewhat uncertain behavior, it might glitch, it might have a noise signal like this, it might have excessive delay in sampling. At some point you're going to get some, some unusual behavior here. And the problem is if there's logic following B, then you're getting then this data feeding into that logic is not changing T clock to Q after clock 2. So you can't properly calculate the timing in the logic that follows. You'll get timing errors in that logic uh, that uh, your high-level simulations possibly didn't even uh, predict. Now you notice B is eventually correct on this next rising edge of the clock, as long as A stays the same then uh, A is finally correctly sampled onto B. But this metastability will cause problems in the follow-on logic. So the solution is to introduce a second flip-flop. The idea is, if this metastability is at least resolved by this next clock edge, all C will do will sample the correct value of B once B has a stable signal to sample, and C is a nice clean signal that won't cause problems in the follow-on logic. So this works as long 
as the details of the flip-flop design, and this is library specific, ensures that this metastability is resolved within one clock period of clock two, which is the case as shown here. If it's not resolved, then a solution is add a third flop to clock two over here uh, that uh, allows us to eventually resolve it through the chain of flip-flops. And that's the point I mentioned here, uh, that if this is a problem, then you fix it with a third receive flop. Of course, given the metastability time delay is a function of the flop design, the faster clock two is, the more likely you are to have this problem. So this requires careful analysis if you're pushing the clock frequency higher uh, than, than you previously analyzed the library for. Then you might ask, why have a flip-flop in the first clock domain? Why not just come from logic? And the reason is, this flip-flop ensures that A is glitch-free. It only changes once per clock cycle. If this was combinational logic instead, then A will change potentially multiple times per clock cycle. As the fast pass resolve, A changes value. As the slow pass resolve after that, A changes value again. Thus, you get multiple edges in A, and thus you're more likely to sample one of those edges in clock two, and more likely to have metastability behavior with even more uncertainty in the timing relationships. Then there's the question, can clock two be slower than clock one? And the short answer is no, otherwise you'll miss edges. Admittedly, some scenarios, you might not care about capturing all the data, in which case that would be okay. But most scenarios, you actually want to capture all the data. So in this case, clock one is slower than clock two. There's a longer period. The reason for that is if clock two missed A just shortly after it changed or as it's changed, because the next edge comes sooner than A changing, then A is finally correctly sampled here. If clock one was faster, the name might look something like this. And A would never be correctly sampled into the second clock domain. So technically, the clock period of clock two has to be slower. Sorry, this should be less than, not greater than. Uh, should be, uh, that, I'll fix that in the notes. The should be slower then it should be at least t hold shorter than clock one. The reason for that is you want this signal A to be stable at least t hold after this point. You, so this transition here has to be at least uh, clock period of two plus t hold. This is often approximated that T clock two must be one and a half times faster than, than clock one. That is, there's three edges of clock two for every clock period of clock one. And this is what's shown on the previous page. Uh, and this leads to that property that A is stable on that second clock edge and clock two as opposed to on the first clock edge. Now, there is a, an issue here that we also have to deal with, and that is that uh, under certain conditions, given that clock two is faster than clock one, the signal on A might be sampled twice. Right? Let's say clock two is even faster again uh, during this long time, during this one clock period when A is, well, let, let's say clock two is just pushed slightly to the right. Then this clock period will sample A correctly, and this clock period will sample the same value of A correctly. This one bit period of A in clock one is sampled as two bit periods in clock two. So you might think you have two zeros instead of just one zero. Uh, this again might not matter depending on the intent of the design. If it does matter, and I know we haven't covered Verilog yet, but if it does matter, what you can do is compare C add a second flop and compare C and D and just detect the changes. 
So whenever there's a, so all you do is keep track of the changes in in, uh, in what's happening in the clock too, and only respond when a signal has changed. The reason this works is because uh, that that's what you want. You want to know when A changes, uh, and if it doesn't change in two successive clock periods, you just want to ignore that. So again, that works fine if you're going from a slower clock to a faster clock. But if the clocks are about the same, or you're going from a faster clock to a slower clock, you need some other mechanism to capture all the data that's crossing that clock edge. And the most standard way to do that is an asynchronous FIFO. There's no asynchronous logic in an asynchronous FIFO. It just manages the uh, asynchronicity of the interface, and that's why it's called an asynchronous FIFO. So you might recall a FIFO is a first-in, first-out buffer. You have a memory with two to the n entries in it, so let's say from address 0 to address uh, 2 to the n. Uh, you might recall if you write to this address, you next write to that address 0. It's a circular buffer. You keep track of which reg of the, the address you're writing to next. And you keep track of the address you're reading from next. So in clock domain 1, you have a write register. In clock domain 2, you have a read register. Initially, on reset, both of these point to address 0. Then, as you write in, the, the write address increments as you write down, as you write into the uh, successive registers or, or memory RAM entries. As you read out, where the read pointer is reading successively goes down as well. Eventually, both of them hit the end of the buffer. And remember, all they do is rotate back to the beginning again. So we need some way to detect when the FIFO is empty and some way to detect when it's full. Unfortunately, if you just look at the addresses, they're both the same condition. If, if both of these are pointing at the same address, it might be empty. For example, when, when you start up, they're both pointing at zero. Or it might be full. That is, the uh, read register is still pointing at zero, for example, and the write register is completely wrapped around and is pointing at zero again, meaning that the uh, FIFO is full. So you need some way to detect if the if the write register has rolled around one more time than the read register. And the way you do that is you add one bit to each of these. If these bits are the same, then it hasn't rolled around, and you're not full, you're empty. If they're different, then you're actually full. One of them has gone around this, cycle, this circular buffer one more time than the other, and you are full. And that's the logic I presented here. Again, in Verilog, uh, you can come back to this after you've covered the Verilog notes if you wish. Now we've got the further problem that these write and read registers has to have to cross the clock boundary. You really only care if it's empty on the read side, and you really only care if it's full on the right side. You have a write address register on the right side and a read address register on the left side. We don't, instead of actually comparing the values of these two registers, we instead transfer pointers that correspond to those to the opposing side. Since these are crossing clock domains, we need two flip flops. To resynchronize them as they cross the clock domains. And the idea is if this uh, read pointer that's crossed the domain is similar to the write address, then you know you're full or empty as per the logic on the previous page. However, there's a problem here. And that is, we can't use a conventional binary sequence for the write pointer and read pointer. Let's give you, give you an example. 
And the, and the reason is you don't know when they're going to be sampled as they cross the two clock domains. In a normal binary counter, you count from 0 to 1. When you count to 2, the logic actually goes through intermediate values. All right? You add 1 to this, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1. While the carry is going on, you have the 0 here, and the number is actually 0. Once the carry completes and adds into the next value, then you finally have 2, which is what you expect. You add 1 to that, you will get 0, 0, 1, 1. You add 1 to that, and again you have two intermediate values. 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1, while the carry is going on, you'll have this value. In the next cycle, you'll have 1 plus 0, 0, carry 1, you'll have all the zeros. And finally, the 1 will carry into the third bit to give you the number you want. So there's this, this ripple carry adder has, has problems when it comes to crossing clock domains, because you don't know when you'll actually sample it. In fact, including the glitches, the actual count sequence is 0, 1, 0, 2, 3, 2, 0, 4. And you don't know, and so you could be transitioning from 3 to 4, and you actually will read 0 accidentally. Right, so you, you can't use a conventional uh, sequential count. Instead, what we use is gray code. In gray code, the code is designed so that only one bit changes per clock cycle. So there's no glitches. 0, 1 is the same. 2 is, I apologize, there's an error here. I'll, I'll fix this in the final. This should be 0, 0, 1, 1. This is what you see on your page. And then 3. Uh, only one bit will change. Only one bit changes between subsequent en entries. Now you don't have this glitch problem. And you don't really care if if um, if the, if uh, 0 or 1 is sampled because what we're also going to do is keep track of almost full and almost empty. So as long as this goes through the correct sequence, as it say it's transitioning from 0 to 1, as long as we read 0 to 1, we'll still be okay because we're going to actually track almost full or almost empty. And Cummings uh, shows the details of the code. So that leads us to the end of the section. If you go from a slow clock domain to a fast clock domain, the usual technique are two synchronizing flip-flops. You have to have roughly equal clocks because the in, in this first technique, the second clock has to be 50% faster than the first clock. So if you, if you can't meet that constraint, you really need an asynchronous FIFO. Uh, using grade code communications so that you will always get the correct sequence of numbers. Thanks very much. Uh, this is an added section to the um, uh, flip flop uh, to the timing notes that added more recently, uh, but this is the last section of the timing notes. Uh, next, we'll start uh, with uh, Verilog.